This is a homily for the 33rd Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 21, verses 5 to 19. Let's see where we are in our journey through Luke's Gospel. Luke's Gospel begins with a prologue, followed by the infancy narrative. We then have a prelude to the public ministry, followed by the Galilean ministry. Jesus and his disciples begin the journey to Jerusalem for the celebration of Passover. We then have the final week in the life of Jesus, beginning with his entry into the Holy City on the day that we now celebrate as Palm Sunday, and culminating with his resurrection from the dead a week later on Easter Sunday. The Gospel concludes with an account of appearances of the risen Lord and his ascension. Note that these divisions in the Gospel are by no means of equal length. So, for example, the prologue is only four verses long. But the journey to Jerusalem is 406 verses long. So, this Sunday's Gospel is set during the final week in the life of Jesus. All four of our Gospels give us an account of the last week in Jesus' life, but only Mark's Gospel delineates with precision one day from another, beginning with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and then culminating with his resurrection on the following Sunday. So relying on Mark's chronology, we can locate the events of today's Gospel on the Tuesday of Holy Week. There isn't a scholarly consensus on the date of the crucifixion, but biblical scholar John Mayer argues that the date that ticks most of the boxes is April the 7th, 30 AD, and many scholars would agree with him. So we could argue that this Sunday's Gospel is set on Tuesday, April the 4th, 30 AD. This Sunday we're reading from chapter 21 of Luke's Gospel, and this chapter can be divided up as follows. We have a story of a widow making a donation in the temple. Jesus predicts the temple's destruction. When the disciples ask when this will happen, Jesus gives a warning about false prophets. Then we have a number of warning signs. Jesus then tells his disciples of the persecution that awaits them. He then says more about the siege of Jerusalem. He then talks about the coming of the Son of Man and the time of his coming. The disciples must therefore stay awake. And finally, we're told that Jesus spends his days teaching in the temple while returning at night to the Mount of Olives. Now, here you can see the episodes from chapter 21 that make up this Sunday's Gospel. So, the topic of chapter 21 is eschatology. And one of the stage props that's used to convey this message is known as apocalyptic. So, let's have a closer look at these two words, eschatology and apocalyptic. Eschatology comes from the Greek word eschatos, which means last. So eschatology is a study of the last things. Now, in the context of chapter 21, the last things refers firstly to the end of the temple and the siege of Jerusalem, and secondly to the coming of the Son of Man and the end of the world. Apocalyptic comes from the Greek word apokalupto. Apo means away from, and kalupto means to cover. So 
Apocalypto means to remove the cover, to uncover, to reveal, or to unveil. It is as if something is hidden or veiled from our eyes, something that we can only see once the veil is removed. Or, to change the metaphor slightly, something is hidden behind a curtain. The English word that we usually use here is revelation. And revelation comes from the Latin re, which means back, and velo, which means to cover. So re, velo, means to unveil, to reveal. That's why the last book of the Bible, the Apocalypse, is also known as the book of Revelation. And what is it that's hidden? What does apocalyptic writing seek to unveil? What does it seek to reveal? It seeks to reveal the future. But why? Well, the simple answer is to give hope, usually to those suffering persecution. Let me offer a hypothetical example that illustrates how apocalyptic writing works. Imagine that you were living in London during the Second World War, during the time of the Great Blitz in 1940-1941. Every night, the Luftwaffe bombed the city of London relentlessly. As a resident of London, you fear that the city will be totally obliterated. Will we be vanquished? Will Hitler be victorious? Imagine, though, that when things were at their worst, when all seemed hopeless, you were given a vision of the future. What would happen if, in 1941, you were given a vision of London in 1945? Imagine that the curtain is opened and you can see clearly into the future. You can see how the war will end. In 1945, Hitler is dead. The Nazis have surrendered. Victory is ours. Remember, though, you're still living back in 1941 and the bombs are still falling. But now that you've seen the future, that must surely give you strength to endure the horrors of the present, because you know that you will be victorious. The enemy will be defeated. You now have hope. Well, this is the technique used by apocalyptic writers. It doesn't promise that the suffering will end here and now, but it offers assurance that in the end you will be victorious. Keeping all of that in mind, let's turn to this Sunday's Gospel. Now remember that Jesus is in the temple. And here you can see what the Jewish temple looked like at the time of Jesus. The temple is surrounded by a number of courtyards. Here you can see the courtyard of the Gentiles. As the name suggests, non-Jews were permitted to enter this courtyard, but they were unable to approach any closer to the temple than this. Here you can see what was called the Soreg, a stone latticework fence, which according to the Jewish historian Josephus was 1.5 metres or 5 foot high. Plaques, written in both Latin and Greek, were attached to this wall, forbidding Gentiles to pass beyond that point under pain of death. One of these plaques bearing the Greek text was found in 1870. It reads... No stranger is to enter within the balustrade around the temple and enclosure. Whoever is caught will be responsible to himself for his death, which will ensue. Here is the soreg at ground level. 
Now, today's gospel is almost certainly set in the courtyard of the women, for reasons that I'll explain in a moment. Both Jewish men and women could enter this courtyard. A gate, known as Nicanor's Gate, led into the court of the Israelites and the court of the priests. So here's another view of the courtyard of the women, and another view of Nicanor's Gate leading to the court of the Israelites and the court of the priests. We are here looking through Nicanor's Gate into the courtyards of the Israelites and the courtyard of the priests. Women were not permitted to pass beyond Nicanor's Gate. Now on this diagram you can see where Nicanor's Gate is located. The court of the Israelites is coloured blue in this diagram. That court was open to all male Jews. The court of the priests, coloured pink in this diagram, was over a metre higher than the court of the Israelites. Non-priests could only enter the court of the priests when presenting an animal to be sacrificed. Here you can see the altar of sacrifice. And here's another view of the altar of sacrifice situated in front of the temple. And here in yellow in this diagram is the temple itself. Only priests could enter the temple. And here's another view of the temple. Within the temple there were two main spaces. Firstly, the sanctuary or heikal in Hebrew. The altar of incense was located in the sanctuary. In chapter 1 of Luke's Gospel, we're told that Zechariah was offering incense here when the angel Gabriel appeared to him and told him that he and his wife Elizabeth would have a child, whom they are to name John. The most sacred part of the temple, the Holy of Holies, Kadosh HaKodoshim, was separated from the sanctuary by two curtains, and the only person permitted to enter the Holy of Holies was the high priest, and then on only one day of the year, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Philo of Alexandria tells us that any Jewish intruder, even a priest, faced death without appeal if found in the innermost holy of holies. But let's return to the courtyard of women. From where we're situated here, you can see the steps ascending to Nicanor's gate into the court of the Israelites and the court of the priests. Notice those two unusual attachments to the wall. They were called the trumpets, because that's what they looked like. This is where people made donations, and there were 13 of them, each receiving donations for a specific purpose. For instance, for the wood that was used to burn the sacrifice, or for the incense that was burnt on the altar, or for the upkeep of the sacred vessels, and so on. Jesus was seated somewhere close by here, and Luke tells us that he saw rich people making their offerings. But then he noticed an impoverished widow putting in two small coins. Jesus then said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than any of them. For these have all given money they could spare, but she, in her poverty, has put in all she had to live on. Now this brings us to the beginning of today's Gospel. Luke tells us that some people were talking about the Jewish temple, remarking how it was adorned with fine stonework and votive offerings. And Jesus says, All these things you are staring at now, the time will come when not a single stone will be left on another. Everything will be destroyed. But this is not the first time 
that Jesus has spoken about the destruction of the temple. Two days earlier, on the day that we now call Palm Sunday, Jesus approaches Jerusalem by way of Bethany and Bethpage. As he travels down the path from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples joyfully begins to praise God. Blessed is he who is coming as king in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heavens. But as Jesus catches sight of Jerusalem, he sheds tears over it and says, A time is coming when your enemies will raise fortifications all round you, when they will encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you and the children within you to the ground. They will leave not one stone upon another within you. And so it came to pass some 40 years later. In 66 AD, the Jews foolishly rebelled, thinking they could cast off the yoke of imperial Rome. The rebellion ended with the siege of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. The Jewish historian Josephus, himself an eyewitness of the siege, described the scene. Everywhere was slaughter and flight. Most of the victims were peaceful citizens, weak and unarmed, butchered wherever they were caught. Round the altar, the heaps of corpses grew higher and higher, while down the sanctuary steps poured a river of blood. Josephus gives the death toll at 1,100,000, and 97,000 people were carried away into captivity. The Roman historian Tacitus puts the death toll at 600,000. Now, the population of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus was about 40,000 people, so those figures might seem somewhat inflated. However, Josephus tells us that the army of Titus arrived at the gates of Jerusalem at the time of Passover, one of the three great pilgrimage feasts, and tens of thousands of pilgrims would have come to Jerusalem. According to the biblical scholar E.P. Sanders, it seems reasonable to think of 300,000 to 500,000 people attending the festivals in Jerusalem, especially Passover. This painting focuses on the final stages of the siege of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Notice that the menorah, the seven-branched lampstand that once stood in the temple, is being carried off as booty by the victorious Romans. This scene is portrayed on the Arch of Titus in Rome. The arch was constructed in 81 AD by the Emperor Domitian, shortly after the death of his older brother Titus, to commemorate Titus's victories, including the siege of Jerusalem. The scene showing the spoils from the siege of Jerusalem can be seen here, on the inside of the arch. And when we view a close-up of the relief, you can see that the menorah is one of the prominent items of booty. Vespasian was the Roman emperor in 70 AD, and Titus, his son, was the general who led the siege of Jerusalem. At the time, Vespasian needed funds to complete the building of the Colosseum in Rome, the ruins of which you can still visit today. So the construction of the Colosseum was funded in large part by money taken from the temple treasury and from the sale of Jewish slaves. Jesus' prophecy that the temple was going to be totally destroyed would have come as a tremendous shock to the disciples. The Jerusalem temple and the sacrifices offered there lay at the very heart of Jewish life. Obviously startled by what Jesus has just said, they ask him, Master, when will this happen? And what sign will there be that it's about to take place? Jesus responds by warning the disciples about false prophets. 
Take care not to be led astray, for many will come using my name and saying, I am the one, and the time is near at hand. Do not follow them. Jesus then speaks about warning signs. And when you hear of wars and upheavals, do not be terrified, for these things must happen first, but the end will not come at once. Nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and plagues and famines in various places. There will be terrifying events and great signs from heaven. Now, here we have an example of apocalyptic. What we might call the stage props of apocalyptic writing are precisely what Jesus has just mentioned. Wars and upheavals, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes, plagues and famines, terrifying events and great signs from heaven. In this context, these signs are not to be interpreted as heralding the end of the world, but rather of the end of the temple and the siege of Jerusalem. We have a second example of apocalyptic a few verses further on in chapter 21, but they're not included in this Sunday's Gospel. Jesus talks about the coming of the Son of Man and the signs that will accompany his coming. There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars, on earth, distress among nations, at the roaring of the sea and waves, as people faint from fear and expectations of what is coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Again, more stage props, typical of apocalyptic. So how should we interpret such language? Well, to help answer that question, consider the world of art. Just as there are many different styles of writing, what we call a literary genre, so also there are many different genres of art. Consider, for example, the difference between what is referred to as photorealism and the genre known as surrealism. Photorealism seeks to paint reality, in this case an apple that someone's been eating, just as a camera would photograph it. By way of contrast, surrealism sees reality with an inner eye. So consider this example, Salvador Dali's painting named The Persistence of Memory. Is this a scene that Dali ever witnessed? A scene that he could have photographed? Well, obviously not. Dali is offering us a reflection on the nature of reality. This painting is a meditation on time, on change and decay. Notice the melting watches and ants swarming over one of the watches implying decay. This scene is reality as seen not by a camera, but by an inner eye. Pablo Picasso once said that art is a lie that makes us realise the truth. The point that I'm making here is that the apocalyptic language used in today's gospel is not the literary equivalent of photorealism. In other words, it would be a mistake to search the historical records in an attempt to discover which nation, just prior to 70 AD, was rising up against which nation, and which kingdom was rising up against which kingdom. Likewise, we misunderstand the nature of apocalyptic writing if we attempted to find out precisely where any earthquakes, plagues and famines had occurred in the lead-up to 70 AD. So if we strip away the apocalyptic imagery, what spiritual truths lie beneath this text? 
Well, in today's gospel, Jesus uses apocalyptic language to warn his disciples that they will encounter turbulent times because of their allegiance to him. They will hand you over to imprisonment and bring you before kings and governors because of my name. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relations and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Keep in mind that the Acts of the Apostles is part two of Luke's Gospel, although it doesn't follow immediately after the Gospel in the New Testament. The fulfillment of these prophecies of Jesus about persecution is recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. During the 50s and 60s, prior to the destruction of the temple, disciples of Jesus were seized, persecuted, handed over to synagogues and prisons, led before kings and governors, and some were put to death. But here we have the message of today's gospel. In this time of great trial, they are not to lose hope. And why? because Jesus will give them an eloquence and a wisdom that none of their opponents will be able to resist or contradict. Before the final coming of the Son of Man, there is a long journey to be faced. It will be marked by suffering and persecution, but it will also be marked by the loving and guiding presence of a faithful God. Jesus assures his disciples Not a hair of your head will be lost. Victory will be yours in the final triumph of God.